on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And we're sitting in for Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV online, on TV, on radio and on your smart speaker. And we're with you live from 1 till 3 every weekday afternoon. Coming up on the show, following Dominic Cummings' explosive appearance in front of the COVID inquiry yesterday, today, the senior civil servant, he banded the C word, has given her testimony, saying the culture at Downing Street was macho and unprepared for the pandemic. The first group of injured foreigners have been allowed to leave Gaza, entering Egypt in ambulances via the Rafah crossing. The first people to leave since the war started. And plans to use the home of the legendary Dambusters squadron to house asylum seekers are unlawful and should be stopped. That's according to council bosses amid a bitter legal battle to stop the plans. All that coming up over the next few hours. But first, let's get the news headlines with Zora Solomon. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon. One of the top civil servants in government at the time of the pandemic says women were ignored and excluded from making key decisions at the time due to a macho culture at number 10. At the COVID inquiry, Helen McNamara said there were hardly any women talking in important meetings and that they weren't treated with respect by Boris Johnson's government. Women whose job it was to do something were not able to do their jobs properly because... They weren't having the space or being asked the right questions or being treated with the respect that they would do. And it was genuinely, um, yeah, it, was, it was both striking and awful. The first injured evacuees from the Gaza Strip have entered Egypt on ambulances through the Rafa crossing, which has opened for the first time in more than three weeks. Under a deal reached between the Egyptians, Israel and Hamas, a number of foreigners and the critically wounded will be allowed to leave the besieged territory. Well, yesterday, at least 50 people died in an Israeli airstrike on a large refugee camp in Gaza. Elon Musk has warned artificial intelligence could pose existential risk if it becomes anti-human. The billionaire Tesla and SpaceX founder made the comments ahead of joining tech experts and global leaders here at the UK government's first AI safety summit at Bletchley Park. Well, over two days, they're discussing the global future of AI and plans to work towards a shared understanding of its risks. A new study has found frail older people are not being appropriately prioritised when they go to accident and emergency departments. Researchers from the University of Warwick say younger patients with simpler problems are waiting less time to be seen, while patients with conditions linked to ageing are less likely to receive an initial assessment within the four-hour target. Dog owners are voicing their concerns about XL bully dog ban, saying it'll lead to thousands of dogs being put down. The government says the breed is to be outlawed from 2024 following a number of attacks. However, owners are insisting the dogs, despite their appearance, are docile pets. Jennifer White is a spokesperson for PETA. And of course, antisocial behaviour and, you know, irresponsible dog ownership plays a huge part in this. But it is undeniable that the rise in fatal dog attacks is correlated with the rise of these dogs in the UK. And yeah. unfortunately, because of how they look, they do end up in the wrong hands. And they are the most breed that is likely going to be chained up, be abused, mm -hmm. punched, kicked. And another two men have been arrested and bailed after the iconic Sycamore Gap tree was chopped down. The damage to the landmark at Hadrian's Wall provoked anger and upset right around the world. Northumbria police arrested and later bailed a 16-year-old male and a 60-year-old man within days of the incident. Well, that's the latest. Now time for the weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
Hello. A lot of wet and windy weather to come over the next few days. Not too bad for today. We are going to see plenty of blustery showers and some will be heavy and thundery for England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And across the northeast of Scotland, there's more sh persistent showery rain. But other than that, it's not looking too windy, but not for long. A storm, Kieran, is approaching and uh, the southwest will become increasingly windy later. And as we head into tonight, Kieran will continue moving its way further northwards across much of uh, central and southern areas of England and Wales. There will be widespread heavy spells of rain, but also increasingly strong winds. The Met Office have warnings for the rain and the wind. There could be gusts widely of 50 to 60 miles per hour across those yellow marked areas and possibly up to 90 miles per hour, especially so in the southwest for the early hours of tomorrow morning. There will be uh, very wet and windy conditions continuing through the day across England and Wales, in fact. And in f there are warnings in force for the northeast of England, the north of Wales and eastern parts of Northern Ireland for the rain as that rain falls on already saturated ground. The northwest, though, will be mostly fine. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back. Lots coming up in the next couple of hours, including the first foreign nationals leaving Gaza and the migrant row erupting at RAF Scampton. Uh, so, uh, uh, Alex, uh, this is our third show. It's a it hat is. trick of shows. I know. Uh, and what a success they've been I'm so hating far. Every moment. He said, but he would, <laughs> wouldn't he? Uh, but uh, we have been gifted with a very busy news agenda all three days, and today is no exception. The COVID yeah. inquiry is something the else. The COVID inquiry is something else. I mean, Dominic Cummings is entertainment, isn't he? I feel like he shouldn't be entertainment, but he is. Oh, sure but, is. You know, <laughs> as soon as his name comes into anything, it becomes the Dominic Cummings show. And uh, that's what we're getting today. And and, and so the, the colourful language, when you're looking at some of the outputs, it was sort of half silence, yeah. half blanked, constant warnings coming yeah. up on the television. Yeah. Um, and I they mean... Say, and they say oh, uh, Dominic Cummings referred to uh, cabinet ministers as morons. He referred to them as something a lot worse. I know, that. but he's been accused, hasn't he, of misogynistic behaviour and his res response is, I'm awful about everybody. But I think he's got a point there, in fairness to him. Uh, I think he's an equal opportunity insulter. But, you know, I've got my own little Dominic Cummings anecdote. Cool. He probably wouldn't remember this. Yeah. Um, but I was um, once walking across Westminster Bridge with him yeah. and somebody else just before the Brexit right, campaign. Right. Of course, this is the man who bowled up uh, you know, six you weeks. worked with him. Well, well no, I didn't, bit. really. Um, anyway. Because he was Vote Leave. I was sort of connected to Leave.eu. Yeah, Do you yeah, remember yeah. that whole weird yeah, uh, internecine warfare? Yes. Um, but, you know, he, of course, <laughs> bowled up and did the referendum, forgetting that people like Nigel and I had been banging the drum for this and, invent, you know, coming up the narratives and the mm. strategy for about a decade. And someone said to him, we're walking across a bridge and uh, had proposed to him, oh, you know, for the campaign, you really should get Alex in there to be your head of media. You know, she's, mm. she's the one person who knows everything about Brexit, having been doing this for years. Yeah. And uh, the response was, I wouldn't work with that awful woman. <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah, now you tell me. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's high praise indeed, actually. Yeah. A badge well, of I'm very pleased to be working with such an awful woman. I, I know. I, I, I do my I best. I mean that. I mean that. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, meanwhile, we'd love to hear from you too. Uh, give us a call on 0344 499 1000. Or you can text us to write talk in your message and send it to 87. 222, or you can tweet us on x at talk tv uh, but uh, to our top story now and it was an explosive day at the covid inquiry yesterday with dominic cummings accusing boris johnson of being surrounded by useless civil servants and today one of those civil servants uh said that the former aide had reportedly called her the c word uh she took the stand uh, former deputy cabinet secretary helen Mac McNamara began her evidence by criticising the jovial and macho culture at Downing Street with a Prime Minister who was difficult to confront. It was striking that something that I felt personally was obviously deeply worrying, that the, there was a sort of de facto assumption that we were going to be great without any of the hesitancy or questioning or that sort of behind-closed-doors bit of government, which isn't about saying everything's smashing and going brilliantly, but actually being a bit more reflective and checking that everything's going to be quite as great as we'd like it to be. I wanted to ask you whether um, this was just sort of macho posturing or, or whether it actually had an effect on policy. 
Um, and, and is it the case then, do you think, that this approach you're describing uh, slowed down or even prevented the government from doing perhaps the messaging that it ought to have done? I think it would be quite hard for me to know, because there is a, you know, if you, if you are in that sort of meeting with that sort of prime minister in that sort of environment, it's quite hard to be the person who injects a note of caution. Well, she also echoed criticism that there was no plan for dealing with the pandemic and addressed the language used by Dominic Cummings towards her. The things that Mr Cummings, having seen those messages, it was, you know, it's not, it's horrible to read, but it is both surprising and not surprising to me, and I don't know which is worse. Uh, it wasn't a pleasant place to work. I was doing my job as a civil servant, and uh, that... I'm confident about that, and the way in which it was considered appropriate to describe what should happen to me, yes, as a woman, but yes, as a civil servant. It's been disappointing to me that the Prime Minister didn't pick him up on the use of some of that violent and misogynistic language. Joining us now is James Heal, political correspondent at The Spectator. Uh, welcome, James. Uh, well, a lot of... Uh... Uh, colourful language flying around at number 10 at the uh, heart of the COVID crisis. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's that much to worry about. A lot of pompous people say, oh, you can't use those kind of words in the... Well, you know, every office, we know what they're like. It doesn't necessarily mean an office is dysfunctional because people are swearing at each other and calling each other nasty names behind their backs. In fact, I would suggest it happens in every office. Uh, but what we're getting here is a shocking picture of dysfunctional chaos. A boss who no one could relate to, uh, who apparently changed his mind with every person he spoke to, uh, civil servants and politicians not interacting at all, uh, Dominic Cummings at the centre of it, uh, accepting no responsibility for this dysfunction, uh, but uh, with a kind of, I would say, a seriously unhealthy disregard uh, for politicians in particular. His name for cabinet ministers was appalling. Uh, I don't mind the language. It's just the contempt that I don't think helps at all. So I think that's the story that has emerged. I didn't think this COVID inquiry would produce any decent stories. Uh, I think the COVID inquiry is ridiculous because it's not even considering whether or not lockdowns worked. It should be. Uh, however, this is a story, this is a hell of a story, that this country, at the height of its worst crisis since the Second World War, uh, was a dysfunctional basket case run by a guy who couldn't organise a booze up in a brewery. Uh, it's really, really disconcerting, isn't it? It is, and I think yesterday we had all the fireworks, the expletives, the explosions, Dominic Cummings. Today we had a much more sober, contrite appearance from Helen McNamara, and I think that really emphasises how this wasn't just one faction of Number Ten, or wasn't just the political um, moment, the political members of the Number Ten team saying this was the civil servants as well. And I think the fact that Helen McNamara, who of course Dominic Cummings said he wants to handcuff and lead out of Number Ten, was now basically corroborating a lot of his account today, uh, really shows that actually it wasn't about necessarily people with partisan agendas. They all thought, actually, Boris Johnson wasn't doing a great job in the early days of the pandemic. Uh, and I think that we saw that today in the evidence, and particularly some of the examples, the lack of planning. And uh, already we're seeing people like Matt Hancock emerge quite poorly from all of this. Yeah, James, one thing I want to ask you, which I find very puzzling, is Dominic uh, Cummings, infamously called a career psychopath by Michael Gove, uh, throwing everyone under the bus <laughs> but himself. Now, Gove's ex-wife, Sarah Vine, has said that her husband at the time was saying that he was quite impressed by the way Boris Johnson was handling everything, that he was rising to the challenge and deliberating very sensibly on what the best steps would be and having due care and attention, essentially. And this, of course, was the man who stabbed Boris Johnson in the back previously, so you wouldn't expect praise coming from him automatically. We then learned that Boris Johnson called Cummings a liar about the Barnard Castle trip, claiming that he had no idea that uh, Cummings had gone up north, even though Cummings said to him, sort of gaslighting him, well, you know, you're a bit fuzzy-headed because you weren't well, I did tell you, but you must have forgotten. <laughs> what I don't understand in the context of all of this is why on earth that press conference was called for him, for Dominic Cummings at that critical moment, when it's clear the man 
was, you know, really stirring the pot internally inside number 10 in the Cabinet Office at a time of national crisis. What made him so indispensable that even Boris Johnson felt the need to very publicly protect him when he knew he'd been lying? Well, I think you've got to remember, of course, back in April 2020, it was only um, or well, five months previously since Boris Johnson had pulled off an election victory, which many thought was against the odds. And at the time, Dominic Cummings was a very powerful figure, uh, much more so than your typical chief of staff in number 10, I would suggest. Uh, and I think that he was still very much in the ascent and it was most of his people running number 10. So I think that's perhaps the reason why. And I think at that stage, uh, we, you know, I'm not sure how much Barnard Castle will feature in all of this, but I think that there was very much a sense of the government wanting to stand by its people uh, and therefore did not uh, try and give any kind of um, ammunition to critics who were concerned, you know, on the basis that if they were going to weaken the public health messaging, remember all that really like fierce messaging, etc. So they didn't want to give any ammunition to them. So I suggest that that was why Dominic Cummings, um, you know, was, was defended by the prime minister and spent another, I think, six, seven months in Downing Street under Boris Johnson. Uh, Helen McNamara was notoriously called the C word by uh, Cummings uh, and she has told today of how she felt constantly to be the recipient of a kind of contempt born of a macho culture, jovial macho culture. We hear that incredibly, even in the heart of the COVID crisis, you know, Boris Johnson was being, you know, boostering and going, oh, we'll be OK, we'll get through this, you know, all of this stuff. So what she's actually saying is that number 10 under Boris Johnson was full of public schoolboys uh, who didn't have much time for women. Uh, that, again, is worrying, isn't it? Well, I think especially in the context of how was it affecting decision making, Helen McNamara made the point that you know domestic abuse victims, issues around abortion were not considered properly, particularly the start of the pandemic. I remember at the time uh, writing about the beauty sector, which employs, you know, uh, thousands of jobs across the UK and their concerns that they weren't being felt, unlike perhaps, you know, the attention that was given to pubs. So I think that there was a concern that well, how much is that in impacting policy making? I think that's one of the big issues we're going to see over the next year or so. But yeah, I think the, the what's come out of Helen McNamara's evidence today is really the kind of, it wasn't just the sort of how many men do you have, et cetera. You know, it was also the kind of culture at the time. And it it lent into what was a very kind of have a go hero kind of culture. Where everyone wanted, wanted to save the day. And that meant a really stressful environment in which no one got the best out of each other. And we led to this utter chaos and dysfunction, which is now emerging from the past two days. I mean, it is worth mentioning, of course, that uh, uh, she was ethics chief and McNamara was the one who provided the karaoke machine for that infamous party that they had uh, in <laughs> Downing Street. So, you know, her hands aren't completely clean on all of this. Um, but what I find extraordinary, actually, is listening to some of the evidence over the past two days, it seemed that the government already had in place a behavioural insights unit, something that was based upon psychology specialists um, who would know how to communicate messaging. And yet the cohort in number 10 decided to go their own way, the sort of Dom Cummings campaign cohort, and completely ignore that advice. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those big issues. That was the concern around the time of, you know, 2020. Um, remember, of course, after the first lockdown, when suddenly in the summer, everyone was saying it was fine. And there was the concern that the hands face space campaign, stay home, save lives, protect the NHS, was actually far too effective. And we saw on Mon uh, yesterday that uh, Lee Kane, who was the number 10 commissary at the time, was saying he was involved with that. Um, it was a real issue about how do you get the balance right between the economy and public health. Uh, and I'm sure that's one of those issues which is really almost, you know, everyone will have a different kind of view on that. As you say, Alex, think there's something about behavioural insights took a long time to get used to post-pandemic. And I think probably the economic consequences of that are still living with even now. Uh, the other uh, shocking revelation emerging from this inquiry uh, was that Boris Johnson allegedly... Uh, could not get his head around the tragedy of old people. He said, well, they're going to die anyway. What's the big deal? So that's uh, a very worrying aspect of all of this. Uh, but also, uh, Helen McNamara, uh, you know, as she said, wasn't really listened to, but she went into Cummings and said... Uh, and now, she used some pretty fruity language herself at this point. Uh, she said, uh, "We the problem here, Dominic, is we don't have a plan. We have a full-scale pandemic and we don't have a plan. And then she said, we are F-worded. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, frightening, frightening that th this was a, a, a chaotic office run by a guy that nobody particularly trusted to be at all organised. Uh, and here they had this massive crisis, this medical crisis, and they had not a jot of a plan to deal with it. Uh, 
extraordinary. Uh, but also Helen McNamara, we'll play a little clip now. Uh, being a civil servant, uh, she blames Brexit for everything. Take it away, Helen. Good question. I'm not sure whether there would ever have been a normal patter, pattern of working for Mr Johnson. Um, but I do know that the kind of monomaniacal focus of him and his political team for uh, reasons which I'm sure that they would uh, happily give on just focusing on EU exit from July 2019 and then getting to the election meant that they, at least in the way it was communicated to us, everything else could wait, everything else could wait till after this question was settled. So there you go, James. She blames Brexit, uh, but then again, civil servants blame Brexit for everything. Uh, however, when she made this point about, look, we, she apparently virtually screamed it in the office, we have no plan, and the COVID crisis was already fully upon us. Again, what a frightening thing to learn. Yes, completely, and I think that there are two... Um, real issues which struck with me listening to all of that this morning, one of which was, you know, her claim that uh, Matt Hancock was saying, oh, we have a plan, we have a plan, which she took, didn't investigate, she took him on his word and actually turns out there wasn't a plan to deal with any of this. I mean, I was on Talk TV last night with uh, Andrew Lansley, who was the former health secretary, and he was saying, he was talking to ministers around this time and they were saying, oh, we're using your plan for this. Well, number one, that plan was drawn up in 2011, not 2020. Number two, that plan was to deal with uh, influenza and not a COVID-style um, vi virus outbreak. And the second point of this today also was um, the point where Boris Johnson got ill in April 2020 and the civil service had to really just draw up a plan themselves, apparently, because there was nothing available. They were relying on precedents. Well, I have to ask, you know, how much were they familiar with the kind of precedents of the 1950s when Winston Churchill and Anthony Eden fell ill? They really don't seem to have been. And if there's that lack of institutional knowledge from the civil service, I mean, we can all point fingers at the politicians. Equally, there ought to be some big questions asked about the machine. It's often said that the army is always fighting the last war. The concern about this is that the civil service was fighting the last disaster and have they actually learned i mean i think the answer from this is the answer is nowhere near clear yet no, absolutely uh, just before you go james uh, let's talk about uh, arguably the other big event going on here in britain today and that is the ai conference uh, the great and the good flying in from all over the world people going what's elon musk doing there well i think he knows a lot about it uh, uh, i would have thought it would have been a, an omission for him not to be there people just hate him because he's rich uh, but uh, he's there Kamala Harris is there, uh, so expect fireworks from Kamala. You know what she's like. Uh, she rose without trace and now exists without trace. Uh, but seriously, what, what, what can we expect from this summit? Uh, anything concrete? What will happen? I think really we are operating quite novel ground here and AI is something which most politicians really don't understand. So they've signed this declaration this morning. They want to get everyone sort of at least by the same rules. There's been a concern about why should we invite China, for instance? Well, you know, AI is one of those things, a bit like nuclear weapons, according to the experts. If we don't get this wrong right, it could you know, lead to all sorts of disasters involving humanity. So it's one of the ones where you need collaboration, a basic kind of you know, dialogue on all of this. Uh, it comes at a time when America has just signed, Joe Biden has just signed an executive order on AI, um, getting the government involved in this now half a trillion dollar industry over there in America. Um, so it's something that I think world leaders want to talk about. OK, not all the world leaders can make it, but I think it's important to get a kind of basis on which you can kind of dis have discussions and therefore discuss where is this going to go? Because talking to the experts, as I say, half of them think it's going to kill us all. Thank you, James, here ever so much. Well, let's go now to Kieran Saxon, who is head of investigations at Us For Them, an organisation which stood up for children's interests during the pandemic. Hi, Kieran. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean, Hi, what, I, what I want to start Hi, with, the big debate around the pandemic was quite how far measures should go to protect the most vulnerable. There was a school of thought that said, well, you know, if you just made sure that it was only the most vulnerable who locks down and everybody else got on with their lives, that would be the best possible outcome. And other people were saying, well, look, you know, if you you, you know, go to Marks and Spencers and dawdle about and whatever, you're going to kill your granny. Um, I, I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm going to get, ask for a clip to be played now because Chief Whip Mark Spencer has denied that he said we should let old people get it. Let's hear that. We haven't got that just yet, but this, this was uh, based upon an entry in uh, Patrick Balance's diary. Thankfully, Patrick was keeping a diary during the pandemic um, and, and suggested that, we can hear the clip now, suggested that the former chief whip had said that old people should get it. It was a pretty brutal way of putting it, um, uh, really callous. Um, but, of course, the, the politicians do have to weigh 
um, uh, you know, these public health measures against other things, economy and other aspects of society, our civil liberties and so on. So these are the kind of really, really difficult decisions that they have to make. I mean, the way it was described, it, it sounded pretty, it was just so callous. I didn't, yeah, I couldn't agree with that, the way of describing it. I mean, looking back, it's almost hard to remember that whole period at this point. But looking back, this was yeah. the big debate, wasn't it? The teachers unions were saying, we don't want to go to school. We feel at risk. Uh, parents saying, but you need to send our kids to school. We can't just have them at home. Uh, we know there's been a detrimental effect on education with exam results having to be massaged by marking bodies um, and, and a big impact, of course, on children's mental health and physical health as well. Do you think, though, it was necessary to close down schools? to protect the most vulnerable, like elderly people? No, simply uh, put, no. Um, the, there was always a danger, and, and there is, from other seasonal respiratory diseases to uh, vulnerable. In the case of flu, sometimes uh, young people are vulnerable. In the case of COVID, which eventually ended up being a cold, it was the elderly. That was known fairly early on. The job of the government, which we've seen from the comments from James, they have been dysfunctional in their approach to and did a screeching new turn on, was to do the best to protect those at the most risk. And when there's a thousand time difference in the risk between the elderly and uh, school children, then obviously then you want to put your effort into protecting the, the elderly and minimising the risk for those. With subsequent uh, data and and the level of immunity being comparable to the vaccine, as the JCVI said, for 12 to 15 year olds, means that in effect, right from the start, children had a, a high level of immunity. That's not just to do with reducing harm, but that's just to uh, in reducing transmission as well. Uh, Kieran, I mean, if you look uh, back at the history of the COVID crisis, the government, obviously, uh, before we entered the uh, real heart of it, uh, was quite kind of gung-ho. They said, oh, let's uh, get, uh, let, let the country get herd immunity. Uh, they clearly felt kids should go to school uh, and that we should all get yes. on with our lives, frankly, and suck it up. That was basically their approach. Then in came... Uh, the bonking boffin Neil Ferguson with his little <laughs> models warning Boris and Dominic Cummings that 500,000 people would die, a, 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 a grotesquely wrong prediction that completely changed the course of our approach to the COVID crisis. Uh, after that, it seemed they would not listen. They kept saying, we're following the science. Well, they would not listen to the science. And I would argue that we let a generation of school children down uh, by treating them as yes. if they were just as vulnerable to this virus as everyone else. They weren't. They could have gone to school. Uh, so uh, what yeah. do you feel about that? The fact that kids uh, were made to stay at home, they missed out on you know, the best part of two years of education, and they damn well did not need to. It, it's absolutely tragic, uh, Kevin. Um, the science from from the start, we knew, as I said, the, the complete difference in in harm uh, to school children. Um, looking at the the model, and even from the start, it's been proven or, or demonstrated that there are real strong flaws in the, the model, and to such a degree that John Edmonds, Neil Ferguson, and others are um, walking away from the modelling and claiming that the IFR rate and the basic pre reproduction rate were enough to um, do um, lockdowns and close schools for. That there, there is an awful lot of focus from the, um, the inquiry on long COVID and the damage of uh, people who sadly passed away from COVID, but that we see very little, and the terms of reference didn't even include children at the start. It, it's not just about the Arthur Labinjo Hughes's and the tragic case of the abuse and neglect, uh, which he died from, or the Beth Palmer's who sadly died, he committed suicide because of lockdown. There are, there are thousands and a multitude of harms across 
uh, school children who's, who's missed key events, they've missed proms, they've missed exams, they've missed their friends. It's absolutely tragic. And don't forget, Kieran, uh, at one point, and this was in the psychological realm, that kids were told, well, you can't go to school. So if you go to school, you'll all associate with each other and you'll pass COVID around and then you'll go home and you'll give it to your granny and your granny will die. Uh, this was at the same time we were, we were being told, take the vaccine, then you won't be able to pass it on to your granny and she won't die. Uh, subsequently, we found that the vaccine doesn't stop you passing it on. And we know uh, that kids were never in any danger, really, of even catching it, let alone passing it on to granny. So there's that psychological damage to a generation of kids as well. Yeah. Again, it's absolutely tragic. And, and the message that was being encouraged by uh, the government and uh, activist groups like Independent Sage and uh, um, unions like the NEU was absolutely awful. And, and referring to kids of as vectors of disease is something that the people involved with should be absolutely ashamed of. Uh, as I said, the, the children always had equivalent immunity due to the strong innate immunity, that not only were they, they, um, they were, they're at less risk of passing it on to, to the parents, even, I mean, even to comparable to vaccines. It was an absolute shame. Yeah, Kieran, I couldn't agree more. Kieran Saxon, Head of Investigations, as for them, thank you so much. You know, one of the things that harries me so much is the idea of little you know, infant school kids being forced to wear masks. That, to me, is a form of child abuse. Can a little kid sit in there for six hours in a face mask, little babies? I just think that's just evil. We, we, we uh, uh, disabused uh, kids and old people during the crisis. Oh. Old people were in hospital yeah. with uh, COVID. They said, oh, let's just ten, send them back to their care home to die. Mm. They'll take a few other old people with them, but it doesn't matter. And now we're learning that Boris Johnson just felt this was nature's natural pruning fork, uh, selectivity in action, and that they were going to die anyway. Bad attitude towards the youngest and mm. the oldest in our society. You know, society. we all became armchair epidemiologists, didn't we, in the pandemic? Yeah. But a lot of the common sense things that people thought, there's no such thing as a vaccine that can stop a rhinovirus or coronavirus, you know, it spreads by sneezing yeah. and coughing. Um, you know, that was just completely ignored and have the vaccine to don't you know not infect well, do you other remember people? the vaccine uh, the progression yeah. of the vaccine take the vaccine and then you won't get covid oh wait a minute uh you will get covid but at least you won't be able to pass it on to your grandma oh wait a minute you it you will still pass it on uh so we go uh what so i'll get it I'll still be able to pass it on to my grandmother. Mm. Uh, what exactly is this vaccine for? Oh, well, right. it'll stop you dying. Prove and it only it. worked about three months or something. So, God, I've got to have another one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, you have to sort of appreciate that no one quite knew what they were dealing with in the yeah, first no, three sure, months. Sure. But after that, even I sat there thinking I could do a better job of figuring this out. Anyway, don't doubt it, Alex, don't doubt it. <laughs> your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this lunchtime. Mary has texted, I can't wait for Wales to start a COVID inquiry. They had the most draconian lockdown in the UK. Do you remember their health secretary saying he didn't have time to read any scientific reports at the time? Good old one-party yeah. state of yeah. Wales. Uh, Matthew writes, this COVID pantomime is paving the way for the World Health Organization to be given the authority to can take control of the UK when the next pandemic or climate lockdown comes. Oh, yeah, I forgot about the WHO and King Ted Boss's role oh, in all yeah. of this. <laughs> it's, it's friendliness for China. Um, and Essie's tweeted, for an advisor, Cummings certainly tried to wield a lot of power. No wonder people thought he was running the country. Well, he was, wasn't he? I guess he was, and that's frightening in itself. Coming up after the break, the first foreign nationals have been allowed out of Gaza via the border with Egypt. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and we're sitting in for Julia Hartsby-Brewer, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. Me and you, conquer time. Who wins? You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about Talk Today? 
we do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous What, you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is Never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> there's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yes. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> <film. laughs> right. and Mark. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going. To, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question. You answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. The border between Gaza and Israel is open and some foreign nationals and severely wounded people have been allowed to cross into Europe. British nationals are expected to be allowed to leave in stages through the Rafa crossing over the coming days. It as Israel has defended its decision to launch a missile attack on the refugee camp, which reportedly killed 50 people, saying they were targeting a senior Hamas commander. Meanwhile, Iran's supreme leader has called on Muslim states around the world to halt oil and food exports to Israel in an attempt to stop the bombardment of Gaza. Yeah, joining us now is Fleur Hassan Nahum, Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. Thank you so much for coming on the programme, Fleur. I mean, we're seeing a lot of protests, a lot of activism on the streets of the UK, a lot of people among the public here calling for a ceasefire. And certainly, your case isn't helped, is it, by some of the images out today of that huge crater from a missile attack on what was a refugee camp? Well, you know, unfortunately, even though we left in 2005, and the Palestinian leadership, which then turned into a brutal takeover by Hamas in 2007. There's no reason why there should be any refugee camps anywhere. Uh, the territory was their autonomy. The territory had to be developed by them. Uh, and so the fact that we're even talking about a refugee camp just tells you what these people have been doing with all the foreign aid that has been sent to them instead of actually building a better future for their people. What they've been doing is building an underground terror network uh, the where they cowardly, they cowardly hide and they let their people stay on top. If they really cared about their people, why don't they let them have a shelter? I mean, they Fleur, don't have shelter. Fleur, I think a lot of people there be extremely critical of what Hamas has done to Palestine and indeed the atrocities that they carried out against your country. But the difficulty we've got here is there are civilians who are nothing to do with Hamas, who have been displaced, moved around, feel like they are unsafe anyway, now coming under, um, uh, under bombardment. I mean, can Israel not do more to protect the civilians of Gaza? 
Well, you know, it, it's interesting that you say that, but we we do more than the uh, Hamas do for their own people. We warn. We asked everybody in northern Gaza to move to southern Gaza because that's where we know the heaviest terror infrastructure is. And most people have moved to southern Gaza. And let me tell you who was stopping people moving to southern Gaza, and that was Hamas itself. They were roadblocking and they were shooting people that were trying to escape for safety. You just reported on the Rafa border opening. It was Hamas that wasn't letting British nationals and American nationals out of Gaza, not anybody else. And so ultimately, Israel has to defend itself. How do you think that we can defend itself in this situation where Hamas is using its own citizens, its own children as a human shield? Does the world really expect us to take what happened to us, a massacre, an act of war, take it lying down and not defend ourselves? We don't want, we, it's not our intention to harm the innocents, but they've created a situation where they put innocents in harm's way in order for the pictures to come up and for the whole world to say, look what Israel's doing when it's them who've done this. And if they really cared about their people, why don't they open their underground shelters and let them in? Uh, Fleur, an underplayed element of all of this is obviously uh, your Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, very movingly, I thought, the other night explained why there would be no ceasefire. Uh, a mesmerising performance, whatever you think of that stance. Uh, he said it was his responsibility. Uh, now, uh, so around the world, you've heard it, this chorus of uh, do-gooders really saying, oh, the ceasefire, humanitarian, you know, must save the children and the innocents. Uh, and we all worry about the children and the innocents, of course. Uh, so uh, Israel, we know why Israel doesn't want a ceasefire. So people say, oh, that's terrible. Israel won't call a ceasefire. The underplayed element of this is Hamas, your enemy, does not want a ceasefire either. So if you have a conflict, a war, in which both sides don't want a ceasefire, uh, it seems to me almost spurious, a waste of time to call for a ceasefire. Well, we had a ceasefire and that was broken in October the 7th. We had a ceasefire from last year. They broke the ceasefire. And for Israel, right at this point, a ceasefire would be surrender. Plus, what about our 240 hostages, amongst them five months old babies. Nobody's talking about them. Nobody's talking about their human rights or whether they're getting any medical attention or whether they're using our own people as their, as their human shields. And so I understand that people think that they're doing the right thing by calling for ceasefire. But for Israel, ceasefire would mean surrender and giving up on the 1,400 people who were brutally murdered every day. More details come out of how brutal this was. And I'm telling you, ISIS in Afghanistan has nothing to do with the details and the proof and the movies that we're getting. It's traumatizing. I haven't been able to sleep for weeks with some of the images that I've seen. And so how can anybody expect Israel to stop? What are we stopping for? So that they can rearm and attack us again? So they can get strong again? Yeah, one second, let's take a moment, let's regroup and we'll continue attacking you. Two days ago here in Jerusalem, there was a siren and a, and a, and a missile fell in Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem is an Arab city, which is two kilometers from where I live. They don't want to cease fire. They, they're sending rockets all the time to Israel. So I don't understand these people calling for a ceasefire. They basically want us to surrender to genocidal terrorists. And any country, any sovereign country with any self-respect or any wish to survive and to flourish would not allow this to happen. Uh, we're also hearing for, uh, that uh, on October the 7th, that awful day which will go down in history uh, as a, a day of horror, uh, when grotesque war crimes were committed, uh, we won't go through them again. And a lot of us are asking around the world, how could any human being do what those Hamas, uh, I was going to call them soldiers, those Hamas thugs did? They're terrorists. Terrorists. terrorists is almost too good a word for them. They're thugs. What they did, they raped children, they raped women, they executed people on their doorsteps, innocent people, uh, as we know, they killed cut down 260 kids at a pop concert in a hail of bullets. Uh, and around the world, we're saying, how could any human being, no matter what your conviction, no matter what you believe, how could any human being do that, behead babies? Well, we're hearing now, Fleur, that uh, these Hamas people that invaded 
uh, Israel on October the 7th were actually high uh, on a cocktail of drugs, particularly amphetamines, to the extent that their sensibilities were dulled and they were able yeah. to commit these atrocities. Are you hearing this too? Absolutely. Uh, we even have a witness statements from some of the soldiers who were defending, who got to the front, some of them were very badly injured and some of them were killed, that even when they were down on the floor and they were managing uh, to bring them down to the floor, you could tell they were completely drugged in the way that they were acting. But let me just tell you, it's not just the drugs. You can't take a normal person like you and me, give them drugs and expect us to start beheading people. It's also a culture of complete indoctrination, dehumanizing Jews. And it's in their educational system, which by the way, is funded for by UNRWA, which is fun, which is from part of the UN and funded uh, by a large part of the world. I've been to uh, the, the, the Houses of Parliament and the House of Lords a number of times to talk about asking uh, the, the world powers to fund the Palestinian educational system on condition that they take out that culture of death and, and, and um, martyrs and how they glorify killing Jews and how they dehumanize Jewish people to the point that they say that Jewish people are not human, they're monkeys and pigs. So when you have that whole horrible lethal cocktail of terrible indoctrination from the moment they're born with an educational system funded by the world through the UN and these terrible, terrible drugs, amphetamines, whatever it was. So it's that combination that created the worst, the worst massacre that has been seen in this territory ever. Fleur, thank you so much for coming on the show today. That was Fleur Hassan Nahum, Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. Coming up after the break, council bosses say government plans to house migrants at the Dam Busters RAF base are unlawful. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and we're sitting in for Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart, smart speaker. Oh, tripping over a Smart speaker. Smart speaker. Oh, like right, uh, moving on. West Lindsay District Council in Lincolnshire is campaigning against government plans to house 2,000 migrants at RAF Scampton, calling the proposal unlawful. The base was home to the legendary Dam Busters, and locals have been keeping a constant vigil outside the base, claiming they're in a battle to save Britain's heritage. Joining us now is Stephen Wolfe, a former MEP and migration expert. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, now, this is a, a situation that is going on all over the country, uh, a story that's under the radar but shouldn't be, uh, because Scampton... Uh, there's a place in Essex. There are places all over the country that the government was putting, for, were, was putting forward as the alternative to the very expensive hotels. We're spending £8 million pounds putting, you know, 100,000 migrants into hotels all over the country, some of them very plush, four stars, with golf courses and spas and all that. Uh, so they thought that was a bad look. So, hey, hey, we found all these disused RAF bases. Uh, they're renovating a prison down in the south, uh, 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 holiday camps, uh, derelict holiday camps are proposed to be renovated to house all of these people, all at quite uh, expensive costs, by the way. Uh, now, what they did uh, in each of these cases, they just imposed this on the lo local community. They used emergency powers the government gave itself during the COVID crisis to override the consultation process to be able to impose these places on local communities. The local communities are rearing up and saying, well, wait a minute, you know, you didn't ask us, this isn't right, and now it's in the courts, and uh, the lawyers for the campaigners are saying, no, 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 no. Uh, if you don't consult, this is not legal. So Rishi's grand alternative accommodation scheme is in deep trouble. It has not happened one bit so far, apart from, finally, about 38 uh, migrants on that barge down in Dorset. Uh, the, uh, the alternative accommodation scheme is simply not happening now. No, you're absolutely right. The alternative scheme that have been offered by the Conservative Party from Boris Johnson right through to Rishi Sunak, although he has staked his uh, premiership on this particular issue, are failing. Rwanda is still stuck in the courts. Bibi has just allowed a few people on. The situation, as you quite clearly explained, about just bursting asylum seekers across various sites owned by the government or bought for them to be able to take the pressure off hotels has failed. And the next problem that you're going to find, Kevin, is one that's raising its head across councils across the country. As Rishi Sunak is increasing the numbers of people that are being allowed to stay in the country through asylum applications on discretionary reasons, not because they're asylum seekers under the UN Refugee Convention or the ECHR, but because he's instructed the Home Office to increase more people to be allowed to stay. Once that happens, it lands on the council, and the councils then have to provide accommodation for them, not the Home Office. And it looks like that be £1.9 billion to councils next year. Gosh, that is a phenomenal amount. I mean, the other government just deaf, dumb and blind here, using somewhere like RAF Scampton, where there is a big <laughs> museum there honouring the dam busters, these brave men and women who essentially defended our borders, defended our country's sovereignty and integrity and defended uh, Europe from Germany running it, which, uh, you know, if I'm not mistaken, has played a huge role in the swathe of migrants crossing the continent. I mean, the optics of this ahead of Remembrance Day are just awful. Yes, the optics are awful, but I don't think the government is really thinking this clearly. Uh, I don't think they're really caring too much now because they've got so much on their hands. But also, it also shows their belief that they know everything that's best, that they have the answers, and they don't have to listen to people. As you said, the two things. One is they're using uh, regulations that were created under the COVID scenario to impose on local communities their decision to house people in this type of accommodation. And as we've seen from the COVID inquiry going on at the moment, particularly that from Dominic Cummings, there are those in government who believe that they're right and they should do it ignoring what everybody else thinks, even if they are completely wrong and proven to be wrong later. So this goes all through the heart of the government. And I don't think it would change under this Conservative government's left if it became the Labour Party. I suspect it would continue to be as bad. 
And uh, this is also all part of the government's <clears throat> three-card trick uh, to deceive uh, the population of Britain into believing that they really are going to bring this accommodation bill down. Uh, as I said earlier, if uh, we continue like this, uh, we currently spend £8 million a night accommodating asylum seekers in 450 hotels all over the country. If we proceed at this rate in three years' time, it will be... £30 million pounds a night. So Sunak is desperate to paint a picture of a Prime Minister who's trying to get the bill down. OK, we'll still have the migrants, but they'll be in cheap places like disused RAF bases. Now, I've been covering the story of uh, the North Eye Prison down uh, near Bexhill in Sussex. It's a derelict, uh, really derelict, uh, old military prison, which the government uh, recently bought for... Uh, this is about how much money it's actually spending to persuade us it's not spending much money. It recently bought North Eye Prison, essentially a pile of bricks, for, uh, uh, for £15 million to renovate it to take a, 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 a migrants will cost another £20 million. Uh, so this is actually uh, an expensive con, all of this, isn't it? Well, it's an expensive scenario all the way through. Last year, when we were saying that the government was spending around uh, eight million pounds a day. People were scoffing at us, if you remember, Kevin, I put those figures out, now it's pretty much accepted. We are mentioning that it's about eight billion pounds a year at the cost of asylum and immigration to the country from collecting people in the sea through the RLNI and border force to identifying them, setting them, to putting them in housing, to giving them funding to live, for medical care, clothes on their back, shifting them out to the council, who are going to be bear the next front of the cost. This is a complete cost fest for, for the taxpayer. Yeah. And Stephen. we're facing it all because governments won't stop it. Stephen, thank you ever so much. Stephen Wolf there. Now, coming up after the break, one of the country's most senior civil servants at the time of the pandemic has lashed out at the macho and misogynistic culture at the heart of Boris Johnson's government. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and we're sitting in for Julia Hartley Brewer. And you're on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you conquer time. Who That's wins? Nice. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for this? You know? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. there's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, I know. You're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this <laughs> now. <laughs> Get right. Mark. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs>
got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going. To, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question. You answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and we're sitting in for Julia Hartley Brewer and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we're with you live from 1 to 3 every weekday afternoon. Coming up in this hour, following Dominic Cummings' explosive appearance in front of the COVID inquiry yesterday, today, senior civil servant he branded the C-word has given her testimony saying the culture at Downing Street was macho and unprepared for the pandemic. Pressure mounts on Sir Keir Starmer. Protesters mob the Labour leader's car over his stance on the Israel-Hamas conflict after he defended his decision not to back a ceasefire in Gaza. And, Ro and Robert De Niro uh, takes the stand. A legendary actor is in court accused of abusive language, physical advances and misogyny by a former employee. Accusations he denies. So... Yeah, we have loads coming up in the next hour, including another explosive day of mudslinging at the COVID inquiry. We're also going to be talking about, once again, uh, police in this country, Manchester police this time, not the Met Police, being caught pulling down uh, those pictures mm. of hostages, including child hostages that have been uh, captured by Hamas. Yeah, and these are heartfelt posters put up by Jewish people about, as you say, those poor hostages trapped in those awful dungeons beneath Gaza. It's a heartfelt, uh, simple demonstration of empathy. Mm. Uh, now, we've seen uh, extremist uh, women in hijabs pulling these yeah. things down. They're pro-Palestine. I don't necessarily approve of that, but they're pro-Palestine. They would do that, wouldn't mm. they? Uh, the police... The police got caught yesterday doing it in Primrose Hill in North London, fairly near where I live, and uh, now they've been caught doing it in Manchester. This is pro-Palestinian activity. Why are the police doing it? I mean, the police would argue, wouldn't they, that uh, yeah. all of these things could act as provocation. What they don't want to see is some sort of, you know, increased tension on the streets of Britain, that there are two communities at war here. There are those who are on one side, those on the other. Jewish people feel threatened. Uh, people who are seeing what's going on in the Gaza Strip uh, also think that they have a right to talk out about this. But there's a whole different narrative going on there, isn't there, Kevin? Which is, why on earth is this conflict taking over in this country so much? Well, you know, when people didn't turn out when Saudi Arabia is bombing Yemen with weapons, frankly, that Britain supplies to them. Yeah. And yet this, it, it's become a social media war, hasn't it? Yeah, and look what's going on. At the very, for some reason, uh, the pro-Palestinian uh, people have decided that McDonald's is somehow I sympathetic know. to oh, and Israel. Marks and Spencer, they'll gather that side because it is but, of but Jewish with McDonald's, origins. They keep letting mice, so they are dying I mice, uh, you know, the Palestinian flag colors are green, red and black. You know, they, uh, that's, don't Mad. do that. That's really cruel. Don't mm. bring mice, poor little innocent creatures into it for a start. And today, stick insects as well. Oh, but gosh. the police... I mean, what, what next? Will the police turn up at McDonald's with a box full of mice and let them go? Because <laughs> presumably that seems to be... The, I mean, this is what they... Mm. The police uh, tend to follow a fashionable... Uh, political yeah. stances, and that's what well, they're doing here. They're pro-Palestine. What it is, is they are more concerned about not upsetting one particular community than any other. They're more concerned about that than protecting a community that right now is extremely upset by things going on and, uh, you know, including hostages being taken and the atrocities committed by a terrorist organisation. But it just, it, it's, it's emblemat emblematic, isn't it, of a 21st century war being played out on social media. Reports coming that Iran, in fact, are sponsoring a lot of this activism, using 
using bot farms, mm. using a network of influencers, radical clerics, uh, faux charities and all the rest of it in this country. And it's very important in Iran's playbook that we do see people on the streets in the UK. And people don't realize essentially that they're going along with a hostile regime's plan when, yeah. they're, when they're turning out on the streets yeah, and yeah. doing tell these that, things. Tell that to the police. I mean, if yeah. nothing else, the, the, the lack of judgment in sending police officers out to do a partisan act, rip down these Israeli posters. Mm. Uh, the lack of judgment there is quite staggering. And in fact, the Manchester police chief, Stephen Watson, has come out and said, I don't know what happened under my watch, but this is a mistake. And he's right. Oh, Meanwhile, down in London, we've yet to hear from the Met Police about whether it was right that police mm. uh, pulled down these Israeli posters, because they shouldn't be. This is partisan. But it's just, it's becoming some sort of strange football hooligan behaviour, oh, isn't yeah. it? Where people are using their sort of, you know, little Instagram accounts, their TikTok accounts. We should just pull the plug on TikTok at this point, in my opinion. I mean, that is a huge, I think it is a huge... Chinese risk. It is rubbish. Used, it is used to try and destabilise society. <laughs> Interesting yeah. if they discuss that at the AI, yeah. AI conference Made today, Made in China, actually. Don't, don't trust uh, it. And if I rub it on even more, we'd love to hear from you. So give us a call on 0344 499 1000 or text us 8722 is the number to do that. You can tweet us on X, uh, formerly known as Twitter. The hashtag for that is at Talk TV. It's not a hashtag, is it? It's the at thing. Yeah. The handle. Well, I, I, the don't handle. Know. <laughs> I know. Don't ask me. 40 going on 80, me. But first, <laughs> let's get the news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Alex. Good afternoon. One of the top civil servants in government at the time of the pandemic has described Boris Johnson's government as toxic and sexist. At the COVID inquiry, Helen McNamara said women were ignored and excluded from making key decisions at the time due to a macho culture at number 10. She said there were hardly any women talking in important COVID meetings and that they weren't treated with any respect. Women whose job it was to do something were not able to do their jobs properly because they weren't having the space or being asked the right questions or being treated with the respect that they would do. And it was genuinely, um, yeah, it, was, it was both striking and awful. More than 100 foreign nationals and some critically injured people have now left Gaza after the border to Egypt opened for the first time in more than three weeks. Ambulances were able to take them through the Rafah crossing. It's due to a deal between Egypt, Israel and Hamas, which will allow 88 critically wounded people and around 500 foreign nationals to leave the besieged territory. The government has announced a world-first international agreement to ensure threats from artificial intelligence are managed collectively. At the AI summit, which is being held in Milton Keynes, 28 countries, including the UK, US, China and Saudi Arabia, endorsed the so-called Bletchley Declaration. Tech billionaire Elon Musk is also at the meeting and warned artificial intelligence could pose a risk if it becomes anti-human. You know, we're, we're not stronger or faster than other creatures, but we are more intelligent. And, um, and here we are for the first time, really, in human history with something that's going to be far more intelligent than us. A new study has found frail older people are not being appropriately prioritised when they go to accident and emergency departments. Researchers from the University of Warwick say younger patients with simpler problems are waiting less time to be seen, while patients with conditions linked to ageing are less likely to receive an initial assessment within the four-hour target. An inquest into the death of Sir Bobby Charlton has found he died after an accidental fall at a care home. The England and Manchester United legend died in hospital in Macclesfield last month at the age of 86. It was initially thought he hadn't been injured in the fall, but it was later discovered he had fractured his ribs. The coroner gave the cause of death as trauma in the lungs, a fall and dementia. And another two men have been arrested and bailed after the iconic Sycamore Gap tree was chopped down. The damage to the landmark at Hadrian's Wall provoked anger and upset right around the world. Northumbria police arrested and later bailed a 16-year-old male and a 60-year-old man within days of the incident. Well, that's the latest. Now time for today's weather with Nazanin Gaffa.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. A lot of wet and windy weather to come over the next few days. Not too bad for today. We are going to see plenty of blustery showers and some will be heavy and thundery for England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And across the northeast of Scotland, there's more sh persistent showery rain. But other than that, it's not looking too windy, but not for long. A storm, Kieran, is approaching and uh, the southwest will become increasingly windy later. And as we head into tonight, Kieran will continue moving its way further northwards across much of uh, central and southern areas of England and Wales. There will be widespread heavy spells of rain, but also increasingly strong winds. The Met Office have warnings for the rain and the wind. There could be gusts widely of 50 to 60 miles per hour across those yellow marked areas and possibly up to 90 miles per hour, especially so in the southwest for the early hours of tomorrow morning. There will be uh, very wet and windy conditions continuing through the day across England and Wales, in fact, and in there are warnings in force for the northeast of England, the north of Wales and eastern parts of Northern Ireland for the rain as that rain falls on already saturated ground. The northwest, though, will be mostly fine. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back. Now, it was an explosive day at the COVID inquiry yesterday with Dominic Cummings accusing Boris Johnson of being surrounded by useless civil servants. And today, one of those civil servants, in fact, the very one that Cummings called the C word, took to the stand. I do so. Former Deputy Cabinet Secretary Helen McNamara began her evidence by criticising the jovial and macho culture at Downing Street with a Prime Minister that was difficult to confront. It was striking that something that I felt personally was obviously deeply worrying, that the, there was a sort of de facto assumption that we were going to be great without any of the hesitancy or questioning or that sort of behind-closed-doors bit of government, which isn't about saying everything's smashing and going brilliantly, but actually being a bit more reflective and checking that everything's going to be quite as great as we'd like it to be. I wanted to ask you whether um, this was just sort of macho posturing or, or whether it actually had an effect on policy. Um, and, and is it the case, then, do you think that this approach you're describing uh, slowed down or even prevented the government from doing perhaps the messaging that it ought to have done? I think it would be quite hard for me to know, because there is a, you know, if you, if you are in that sort of meeting with that sort of prime minister in that sort of environment, it's quite hard to be the person who injects a note of caution. She also echoed criticism that there was no plan for dealing with the pandemic and addressed the language used by Dominic Cummings towards her. The things that Mr Cummings, having seen those messages, it was, you know, it's not, it's horrible to read, but it is both surprising and not surprising to me, and I don't know which is worse. Uh, it wasn't a pleasant place to work. I was doing my job as a civil servant, and uh, that, I'm confident about that, and the way in which it was considered appropriate to describe what should happen to me yes as a woman, but yes as a civil servant. It's been disappointing to me that the Prime Minister didn't pick him up on the use of some of that violent and misogynistic language. Uh, joining us now is Madeleine Grant, columnist and sketch writer at The Telegraph. Uh, welcome, Madeleine. Uh, you're a journalist of some note. You've been around Westminster a lot. Uh, what Helen McNamara is describing there in Number 10 Downing Street strikes me, you know, as a bunch of sort of public school boys who went to all boys' schools. They're not uh, comfortable around women. And frankly, uh, according to Helen, they showed contempt uh, for women. Uh, did you detect... Uh, that kind of culture around Westminster? Is it still an old boys' club? Well, to be honest, I'm not really the person to ask about this because although I do work in Westminster, I'm the, the parliamentary sketch writer, so my job is to kind of observe from a distance and mock the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm probably not the person to say whether or not this this culture is 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 real or not, certainly not within... Um, the corridors of Downing Street. But I do think it's interesting that, you know, this is supposed to be a big public inquiry about the whole range and um, remit of our response to 
this global pandemic. And already, you know, a great deal of the testimony is focusing on personalities and a great deal of the media coverage, you know, including right now is is focused on those personalities. And, you know, I, I despair of us actually taking anything um, substantive from these proceedings beyond, you know, tittle tattle and um, well, not not that it's gossip. I'm not saying that it's any of this stuff is not true, but it's just that this almost felt like we were sitting in on like an HR dispute rather than <laughs> a big public inquiry about the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, it must be a brilliant food for thought for a sketch writer, I'd imagine. But I mean, it's one thing I have sort of thought about this whole thing is um, listening to Helen McNamara. I mean, you know, we all as women know those men who have that sort of, you know, brutish way about them. They are uncomfortable to work with, quite frankly, probably for men as well. Uh, I, I stand by all boys schools, by true. the way, because I actually went to one, believe it or not, in the sixth form. An all boys um, school. An all boys well, not school. all boys then. Yeah, no, just in the sixth form, not, not the whole okay. lot of it. I haven't had any yeah. surgery. Um, but it does strike me, actually, given that at some point she blamed Brexit for the lack <laughs> of, of a preparedness did. for the pandemic, that when Dominic Cummings says there's this cultural divide between Number 10 Downing Street and the civil service, that they push back on anything that ministers want to do, something that Suella Braverman seems to find out, that he might have a point. Well, actually, with the... Um... What was interesting about the Brexit testimony was that elsewhere, although many people seized upon that line, elsewhere she, Helen McMorra and indeed others who have been questioned have acknowledged that preparing for no deal meant that the civil servant was better prepared for a range of other unexpected circumstances. So it wasn't quite even as black and white as some people would perhaps um, suggest. Um, yeah, in terms of the remoteness, I mean, I thought, you know, that was quite interesting that at various points, uh, Helen McMorra made the point that, you know, there was this macho culture, there was this elitism. She talked about football stadiums being um, that uh, ministers and people in those meetings who were trying to make rules about how football matches could go ahead probably hadn't been to a football match themselves, so wouldn't have understood. I do wonder if, you know, all the civil servants are equally, if, if they are as salt, as the, salt of the earth as perhaps um, was implied by these remarks. I mean, I think this is perhaps a much more pervasive problem across the political class than just one of politicians. Uh, what I feel about uh, yesterday's events and what's coming out of this inquiry now, don't forget it's been trundling on now for a few months and you know nobody's really noticed. Uh, it just seems to be a mechanism by which lots of lawyers make lots of money. Uh, and the fact that uh, outside of its remit seems to be whether or not we should have locked down as many times as we did or at all. It's not even considering that. Its only remit seems to be, did we lock down early enough and did we lock down long enough? So that notwithstanding, so suddenly uh, yesterday, I mean, it does make a great story, what, what uh, Cummings was saying, you know, this dysfunction, uh, the swearing, uh, everybody hating each other and uh, the uh, chaotic uselessness of it all. Uh, that, so that, what do you feel uh, about that? I mean, I'm shocked. I suppose, I suppose it, I didn't particularly not expect to hear that uh, all was not smooth and wonderful in uh, inside number 10 Downing Street. But I am pretty shocked about the level of dysfunction that was obviously going on there. Does it surprise you as well, Madeline? Um, no, I mean, I think that <laughs> decision making was chaotic. Um, personalities lo loomed large in Downing Street. Um, Dominic Cummings could behave in a somewhat deranged manner and Matt Hancock got drunk on power. I'm pretty sure I knew all of these things before we started the inquiry. I'm, uh, this, we're in kind of Bears Woods territory here. Um, you know, this is not these are not great revelations. I don't see how they are particularly helpful when it comes to learning lessons for future pandemics, or indeed learning lessons about why, for example, you know, we went into lockdown in the first place. I thought perhaps the most remarkable bit of testimony, from my, in my opinion, to have come out of the the, uh, the inquiry so far is the news from one of uh, the modelling team in Scotland, um, uh, Professor Mark Woolhouse, who basically pointed out that at no point had anyone asked his team involved in modelling outcomes to consider um, the collateral damage of lockdown or even to think of scenarios in which lo lockdown were avoided. So very clearly there was a myopia that set in early on in how decisions were made. And, you know, that question of of, of lockdown and itself and the damage it caused was not really being considered at the time. Now, you know, I think that's pretty unforgivable. 
But once again, I suspect that we're not going to ask enough of those questions to really get to the bottom of it. I mean, is this now not the case with absolutely everything? Ever since Brexit, we've been caught in some sort of strange tribal warfare over everything. And it's almost like, you know, you've got a lot like drop down menus. If you supported Brexit, you probably therefore didn't like lockdowns, but you probably like Boris Johnson and didn't mind about Partygate. And now you'd probably be more on the side of Israel than Palestine. And that we see this now seeping into every single form of public life, essentially the existential crisis in the Conservative Party, the battle for the Conservative Conservative Party is now being played out in this inquiry. This is that's a really interesting point. I'm not sure I fully agree because you know obviously Dominic Cummings was a chief architect of our leaving the EU and he was obviously very pro lockdown. And then you had other examples of people who, like Lord Sumption, for example, perhaps the most prominent critic of lockdown. Um, you know, not involved directly in politics, and he was he was also very anti Brexit. So I, I, I appreciate that. Perhaps these um, these these it's it's these labels and boxes are often relevant, but not not in every case. I mean, yeah, I think I think you know society has become ossified and um, tribal in that way of thinking. I'm sure that social media has had an awful lot to do with this. It's made it much easier for people to on things like um, Twitter or X, as you as I should call it nowadays. It's much easier than ever it used to be to block out um, dissenting viewpoints and only to follow people who agree with you already. And I think that's true on both sides of the divide. Um, I think it has made the business of politics quite difficult because it, when it's more adversarial, it's one tends to attribute the most malign motives possible to every engagement. Whereas, for example, with something like lockdown decision making, I would argue that Although obviously there's a great deal of dysfunctionality and probably some awful behaviour from people. Equally, if you're trying to make decisions in that kind of environment, in the most extraordinary crisis that no one could have predicted, it's hardly surprising if people aren't always behaving their best. You know, I think perhaps sometimes we lose a bit of humanity when it is, is so, um, you know, adversarial and um, always looking for some individual to blame. Yeah. yeah, I think this sort of retrospective trial of WhatsApp messages in a crisis is just stupid. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madeleine Grant. We're joined in the studio now by Professor Carol Sikora, Medical Director at Rutherford Cancer Centres. Carol, thanks so much for coming on the programme. I mean, Madeleine made a point earlier where she's saying this is like an HR dispute. This is sort of, and I was sort of suggesting it's like the continued character assassinations, people salivating at the idea of being able to bring down Boris Johnson and all the rest of it. And the but nasty what names they call yeah, each other. Exactly. But what, <laughs> Big isn't story. Being, what isn't being discussed is what we desperately need to be discussed and to put it bluntly where the lockdown took more lives than COVID itself. Absolutely and Madeline's quite right. Uh, this is all trivia. It's gone. These people have gone from our lives. Cummings, Bont, Johnson, they'll never hold a position again. Uh, maybe on a rival news channel but not in, in politics. <laughs> yeah. So I think we, we've got to look at the we're spending millions of our money mm -hmm. with these people. The lawyers are getting thousands of pounds every day to sit there and ask stupid questions. Mm -hmm. They're not asking the right question because they're law graduates, arts graduates, like most politicians, they don't have a scientific base. The key question is where was the scientific advice coming from mm -hmm. and how powerful and coordinated was it? And it looks to me as though it was completely all over the place. What about this, problem. Carol, uh, as I mentioned to Madeline? Uh, the scandal of this uh, COVID inquiry, if you ask me, because it is a scandal because it's going to cost us, the taxpayers, an absolute mm. fortune, and it will probably trundle on for about 10 years. <laughs> uh, I mean, you laugh, but uh, remember yeah. the Chilton inquiry? 13 yep. years. They, they go on forever, these things. Uh, the scandal of it, to, to my mind, it doesn't matter whether, I mean, I have my doubts about lockdowns. I don't think they were a good idea. I don't think they worked. And I think they've left us with serious problems that we're going to suffer for many, many years. So I thought personally they were a terrible idea. It doesn't really matter what I think or, or, or well, it does matter what you think, of course, or what Alex thinks. The point is, surely it should be within the remit of this inquiry yeah. to uh, ruminate on whether or not lockdowns mm. were a good idea in and of themselves. And yet it is not. 
they are never going to uh, discuss yeah. whether or not lockdowns were a good idea and therefore... Just whether we had enough uh, of them. Well, the only thing they seem to be discussing is did we lock down early enough and did we lock down long enough? That is in itself a scandal yeah. that that uh, is not within the remit of this uh, inquiry, right? Absolutely, Kevin. And why didn't they call the Swedes to give evidence mm. who didn't lock down, for example, to get their rationale, their input? Look at the collateral damage. My specialty, oncology, cancer medicine, suffered horrendously. The excess mortality from cancer won't really show for another two years because it's a slow burn, but it'll definitely happen. The, the three years of intermittent lockdown will result in a, a dreadful excess death from cancer over the next three years. So, and there are all sorts of other things, education of kids, uh, especially poor kids. They don't have computers at home. They live in high-rise buildings, council houses and so on. Totally totally let down by the system uh, and, and these people and I think rather than the politicians I mean it's titillation that it fills the newspapers with great stories and the airwaves as well but what we really need to know is how scientific advice was translated into action and that's what's missing a convincing modeler says half a million people will die unless we do something what else would you do if you're prime minister you'd say let's just do it let's lock down very suddenly on the 23rd of march in 2020 so can we change it should it be done differently i don't mind paying money if in five years time another pandemic comes around the corner and these guys have come up with a credible plan mm. and a way to get advice right. very few practicing doctors were involved in giving the advice we were all sent away so oh, we're not interested in cancer it's not your problem and then uh, even the infectious disease guys you know uh, at imperial that i know well they weren't involved in it it was left to modelers uh, trumped up scientists from the drug industry to come up with a solution. And the politicians have no ability to judge the solution, was it credible or not? And they just fell for it. I think even more worryingly that those who were sort of voices of dissent, so to speak, from the scientific community, from the medical community, were demonised and shut down and silenced. But do you worry that unless there's some sort of calculable metric for excess deaths due to COVID policy versus deaths from COVID and how that might have balanced out if things that had been done differently, unless we have something like that, that the government now have a big red button they can press if they want to use it again in an emergency because the NHS is a disaster with massive backlogs. Um, and that we also now have a general public who have almost been conditioned mm -hmm. to thinking that this is OK and that they will happily just do it again because they'll say, oh, no, here comes flu, here comes a pandemic, here comes something that the NHS isn't going to be able to handle, stay at home. You're quite right. And behavioural psychology is fascinating and it really played a big part in the COVID pandemic. The slogan at Piccadilly Circus of the, uh, the face of the woman that was dying on oxygen, it looked as though she was dying, saying, protect the NHS this sort of stuff, very powerful psychology. And, you know, do we really need it? Did we actually need it then? Will we need it in future? We've got to change the way we do things. Uh, and uh, let's talk about uh, Boris Johnson was apparently rather gung-ho about old people. Uh, he felt that COVID, well, according to what we're hearing from the inquiry, he felt that COVID was sort of nature's natural pruning for selectivity. These people were going to die anyway. Uh, I think we can uh, hear a little bit of this now. It was a pretty brutal way of putting it, um, uh, really callous. Um, but of course, the, the politicians do have to weigh, um, uh, you know, these public health measures against other things, the economy and other aspects of society, our civil liberties and so on. So these are the kind of really, really difficult decisions that they have to make. I mean, the way it was described, it, it sounded pretty, it was just so callous. I didn't, yeah, I couldn't agree with that, the way of describing it. I think there were two generations that we let down very badly in the COVID crisis. One, of course, was kids, you know, who we kept out of school when they didn't need to be kept out of school, told them that they would infect their grannies if they caught COVID, which uh, they probably would never have caught COVID. So that was spurious and ridiculous. But then, of course, the other uh, type of person that we let down badly was old people, the elderly, uh, you know, uh, oh, they're di they've got COVID, they're probably going to die, shove them back in the care home, etc., cetera, et cetera. And we learn that Boris's attitude uh, was, well, I can't, they're old anyway. Uh, that, you know, in both instances, the way we treated young people and old people, I mean, that 
remains a scandal, doesn't it? I think it does. And, you know, young people especially, lack of opportunity still present for many of them. But the old people, that was just so sad. Locking them in their rooms in care homes. Forget masks, you no need. If you lock someone up, shove the food through the door and shut the door and run away. I mean, that was the attitude in many care homes. And because there was no guidance. And it's not, it's not the care home the staff's fault. That they didn't know what to do. So they just acted that. And the tone of the instructions from the Department of Health, from the politicians, was very, very... Exactly as you say, well, you know, they're old, they're, but they don't matter to society. And uh, it was really criminal to look back on that. And of course, these politicians are being given an easy ride by the inquiry, uh, as are the scientists. Yeah. They're almost mm -hmm. being, you know, they say what they like, and the, the, the good baroness just nods her head nicely. Uh, anyone coming out of saying things like I would say, uh, first of all, I'm not welcome there. And secondly, I'd be given a hard time, one feels. One thing I think that the government really failed to do, considering its job in many respects was to protect the public and inform the public, was raise issues that a lot of people at the time were discussing, such as metabolic syndrome, being overweight, being obese, being a critical risk factor for potentially getting COVID, suffering from it badly or even dying from it. And yet the government told people to stay at home and wear masks, but I don't remember any point that they said, do you know what, perhaps if you lost a little bit of weight, got your blood pressure under control, that is one of the best ways of protecting yourself in this pandemic. That was the only intervention you could really do to help yourself. Whether you got COVID or not didn't matter. Your chances of survival were much greater if you were, had a reasonable body mass index than if it was super, you know, very old and very high. And there's no doubt diabetes is something you can't control, but weight is something you can control. Even if you're diabetic, you can reduce weight, you can do more exercise, even if you don't want to go outside. Even if the weather's bad and you don't have a garden, you can still do exercise exercise and that was so important but it was ignored as you say quick last word uh, carol and try to be brief because we don't have much time bit of a big question to ask when we haven't got much time but it's this uh my feeling about lockdowns were you know we all went along with the first one because we were in territory that we uh, didn't understand uh now then we came out of lockdown and uh you know it slowed down the the passage of the uh, virus no doubt about it we came out of uh, lockdown and guess what within days we were back up to speed and everybody was getting COVID again so we locked down again uh, and it slowed the virus down uh, and then we came out and it speeded up again and then we did it again I always say well look if you lock down once and then in the not too distant future you have to lock down again that kind of proves that the first lockdown wasn't particularly effective so that's just my amateurish uh, viewpoint uh, what is your view of lockdowns? Uh, do they work? Should they be encouraged in the future? They do work, but unfortunately they have a high cost. And maybe you can achieve the same ends by not locking down. Isolate the vulnerable mm -hmm. and carry on. A Swedish yeah. kind of approach. We've got thousands of respiratory viruses, just like COVID, hanging around. They're there all the time. We survive. Winter pressures come and go, and it's mainly the elderly that suffer with chest infections in the winter, not particularly because of the virus, but because it triggers a pneumonia and other chest infections that are more serious and take people into hospital, and then they can't come out. But unless we get control for the future, and that's what we're paying for in this inquiry. And I see no data coming from that inquiry that's going to point any way about changing policy for the future. And that's the biggest disappointment to me. It is a disappointment. Totally agree. Yeah, thank you, Professor Carol Sikora. Great to have you in the studio. Well, we have more of your texts coming in this lunchtime. Hannah says, preparedness for the COVID pandemic did not start with Boris Johnson. Theresa May and David Cameron should have made plans and updated them as time went on. Vinny has tweeted, the only reason Boris Johnson got elected in 2019 was because he said he would get Brexit done and that's what the public wanted to hear. It was nothing to do with him or his abilities. And Eddie says, I keep hearing there was no plan in place there was a pandemic plan put in place in 2011 for flu. COVID is similar enough to flu for this plan to have been suitable. Interesting. Coming up after the break, as the conflict escalates in the Middle East, divisions within UK politics and local communities are also intensifying. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And we're sitting in for Julia Hartsley Brewer. And we're with you on Talk TV, on TV, online and on your smart speaker.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And we're sitting in for Julia Hartley Brewer. And you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, as the conflict between Israel and Hamas escalates in the Middle East, it's having a knock-on effect here as well, causing intense divisions politically and within local communities. In Manchester, an investigation is underway after a police officer was caught tearing down posters of Israeli hostages, prompting the chief constable of Greater Manchester Police to admit the force responded badly. My early understanding is that there were a series of complaints about the posters. Uh, an officer um, has been deployed, in fact it was a PCSO, and the PCSO, under instruction, removed the posters. So there's nothing malicious in the intent of the officer, there's nothing that's done off the officer's own bat, but I think reading between the lines, this is where we've responded badly to a complaint, and I think we've got it wrong. This comes just days after two Metropolitan Police officers were seen tearing down similar flyers in North London, to which the Met responded quite differently, saying they were trying to avoid any further increase in community tension. And divisions within the Labour Party are also growing as Keir Starmer continues to defend his stance on the conflict. The Labour leader's car was mobbed by protesters as he left Chatham House yesterday morning after he refused to back calls for a a ceasefire in the region. Well, joining us now is legal commentator Jeremy Bayer uh, Casey. Uh, Jeremy, it's very difficult when the police say on one hand, if we allow people to paper certain parts of the neighbourhood, it could stoke up tensions, lead people to tearing down the posters, which then invites a response. But on the other hand, it, it does seem to, I'd imagine a lot of people out there, that there seems to be appeasement of uh, activism on one side of the community and slightly less sympathy on the other side of the community. Where do you stand on this? Should the police have done what they did? I think you're absolutely right. I think what people are really concerned about is the disparity in the action between how the police are treating the victims of terror and barbarity and abduction when there are posters up around London saying toddlers are abducted, babies are missing, babies have been beheaded. And on the other side of the coin, the fact that the police stand back and seem to do very little when we hear protesters on the streets of London calling for genocide, further attacks against Jews, chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, which of course means from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea, wiping out Israel in the middle. So I think what's really outrageous here is the fact that on the one hand, you see the police standing idly by whilst London becomes a sort of uh, no-go area for people that don't want to be caught up in these marches, especially the Jewish community, which is a very tiny community, on Saturdays. And on the other hand, you see that when people try and put up some posters, the one in the video clip that you're showing was actually put up on the front of a shop, as I understand it, where the owner had been calling for rather appalling things on social media, and that's why it was there. I think that's what's causing the real trouble. People uh, see it as not, not balanced, not fair. Exactly right. And uh, the Stephen Watson, he's the Chief Constable of Manchester, pointing out that there have been some kind of a breakdown in communications up in Manchester and that this should not have happened under his watch. Fair enough. Uh, we'll all allow a, a mistake. Down in London, they're not apologising for this. And, and frankly, I've been to both of these pro-Palestinian marches in London uh, for random reasons. I wasn't taking part. I just happened to get caught up in uh, the two Saturdays in a row, heard them all ch chanting jihad, saw very few cops... Uh, and uh, the cops that I did see, as you say, Stephen, they just stood around benignly watching. Now we see uh, them ripping down these uh, uh, heartfelt posters. They're expressions of empathy by Jewish people yeah. and indeed other people for the terrible fate of those poor people, the hostages in Gaza. Uh, now, the last people we saw tearing down these posters were female uh, pro-Palestinian extremists, you know, wearing habib, uh, hijabs and all that. But then the next people we see doing it 
are the police. Now, if not, you know, this is a, a partisan gesture that they're uh, undertaking here. This is partisan. This is pro-Palestine. And what I'm questioning here is the astonishing lack of judgment by the police to do something like this. The police should not be taking sides. Well, we've got to ask a really important question here, not about what's happening in Israel, but what's actually happening in Britain? What's happening to Britain here? Because how did this all begin? This all began on October the 7th, when Hamas terrorists tore through a border with a democratic state and carried out acts of barbarity that we haven't seen since the days of ISIS. You might say worse than some of the atrocities we saw in the days of ISIS, because this involves beheading babies and raping and murdering teenagers, abducting toddlers. And then I ask you, well, what do we see on the streets of London? Not solidarity with those victims of terror that you might expect, but actually this outrageous anger directed at Israel for defending itself against those acts of terror. This outrageous outpouring, some of which I have to say is clearly genocidal in terms of what it's promoting, what it's saying. I mean, read the Hamas charter for yourself. It's a prescribed terrorist organization. And, you know, as you say, the police standing there saying, well, you know, we don't want to inflame community tensions, so we'll let all this go. But if we see anyone putting up a poster about a missing baby that's been abducted from their childhood home in a kibbutz in Israel, we're going to rip that down. What does that tell you? Not about Israel. What does that tell you about London and Britain and where we are as a country right now? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I, I completely concur, actually. It's a debate, I think, that has been silenced for a very long time. And actually, people finally are feeling emboldened when you see scenes on our streets like that to say we have imported some pretty ugly points of view. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because people have often accused the police of woke policing, of caring more, perhaps, about community relations and not wanting to offend a certain demographic than actually imposing the law as they should do, which is what they're paid to do. But then Sir Mark Rowley, before he became a head honcho at the Met Police, did say to the government, look, the regulations we've got in place are not c clear enough. They're not stringent enough for us to know what we're supposed to be doing. This is something that the police themselves have since repeated do you think that 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 passes muster? Do you think there is an excuse there the police can use that the government haven't given them clear guidelines on how they should police, particularly when it comes to the treatment of particular communities, attitudes and ideologies? Uh, not really. I mean, the last time I looked at the Terrorism Act, there was a very clear offence of the glorification of terrorism. That is the legislation that's there on the statute books right now. And, and I know that the police can use that to arrest people who are doing what, what that statute says, glorifying terrorism, encouraging that sort of behaviour. I'm not talking about the people that peacefully wander along uh, the Whitehall on a Saturday, just sort of minding their own business and joining in the, the, the crowd. But we have all seen the scenes. We know there are many, many people that are there calling for things, as I said, like the River to the Sea chant, uh, and plenty of other, we've seen the black flags, with, 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 which are commonly associated with very extremist groups. You know, the, 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 the statutes are there. The, the, the government couldn't have been any clearer about what it expects. I mean, the prime minister, the home secretary, just about every cabinet minister that's spoken out on this has been utterly clear about what the government expects. But the question is, are the police going to follow that lead and really be robust in their policing of the capital? Because I can tell you, it's not just the Jewish community that cares about this. There are many, many millions of quiet, law-abiding, ordinary British people that do not want to see London and Liverpool Street Station and other landmarks, especially with Remembrance Day coming up, being turned into these slightly threatening no-go areas. Yes. It just isn't right. Yes. Sue Ella Bravman called them hate marches. Uh, that may have been over the top. I wonder what our audience think. Uh, but I think uh, when Sir Mark Rowley says we need clarity about what to do about clear law-breaking. It uh, indicates a reticence on the part of the police uh, to stand in the way of a fashionable left-wing cause, and in this case, mm. pro 
Palestine. And the police always support fashionable left-wing causes like Just Stop Oil and now pro-Palestine. And that is a disgrace. Great to talk to you, Stephen. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, now, uh, your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this lunchtime. Deborah says, the police were right to take all the posters down. There were too many on that shutter and it was someone's business. Oh, OK. Uh, Kayla tweeted, it's not just the British police that are tearing down posters. The French and German police are doing it too. It's disgusting. Agreed. Yeah, no, so, I mean, you know, I, I often have this conversation at home that what is going on with our nation is pretty worrying. Coming up after the break, Robert De Niro has yelled at his former assistant in court as he goes on trial for abusive and misogynistic behaviour towards her. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and we're sitting in for Julia Hartley Brewer and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Morning, everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening. I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored, in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah! <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I am not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the Preservation of the Habitat of the Lesser Spotted New. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's that almost that like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back, my little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going. To, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and we're sitting in for Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Robert De Niro has yelled at his former assistant in a Manhattan courtroom after she sued him for abusive and misogynistic behaviour. Yeah, Graham Chase Robinson is seeking $12 million in damages from the Oscar-winning actor, who is also countersuing her in the same trial. De Niro says Robinson stole things from him, including five million airline points, and he wants three years' worth of her salary returned. 
Joining us now is Amanda Devlin, who is assistant showbiz editor at The Sun. Uh, welcome, Amanda. Now, uh, Robert De Niro, uh, you know, one of uh, Hollywood's biggest stars. He's been around here since the Jurassic Age. Uh, <laughs> great actor, though, of course. Uh, but uh, I would suggest we can't prejudge what uh, the court is going to decide. But he's not coming out of this well, is he? She's he's talking not. about how when uh, she worked for him, she was his $300,000 a year vice president of his production company, which is called Canal Productions, based in New York. She said he that he treated her like, you know, like a sort of skivvy and gave her all these female tasks while male employees uh, went about their business. She was sent to the shops and told to scratch his back. He's admitted this. And at a certain point yesterday, he stood up and lost his temper and screamed across the he court. He screamed and he masks said, lit. He said, shame on you, Graham Chase Robinson. Yeah. If it was me, I would have said, why are you called Graham Chase Robinson? <laughs> That's a bloke's name. It's a bloke's However, name. Well, uh, that's so, misogynistic. Yeah. I'm sorry. I do apologise. Not, 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 not a great, great moment. Not a great moment for De Niro. Though, Absolutely yes. not. I mean, it, firstly, it's such a fascinating insight. I love that Americans just sue for anything and everything because you just get this access, that insight into what it's what the person's really like. Because he's a massive A-list star. You know, won Oscars. Mm. He's 80 years old. And now we're kind of seeing this apparently true colours kind of coming out and all these allegations. And it's not painting him in a good light. And especially standing up and shouting, shame on you, to this woman who's accusing him of such things. And they are, I mean, some of them are quite ridiculous. I mean, they're things like getting a, a martini ordered and put it in an Uber to get over to him like late at night. Or something, wasn't it? This, like you said, you mentioned scratching of the back. Yeah. Um, I mean, she was paid a really hefty wage. Yeah. Um, but, and she worked there for about 11 years. Yeah, she worked there a long time. I mean, I, I'm quite divided on it. People online are quite, his fans are quite divided on yeah. it. Because, I mean, it's not painting him in a nice way. But it, it does sort of make you think, well, God, I would don't mind suing for $12 million. Well, it no, but I mean, it's a huge amount. Doesn't it? it and does seem... of course, and, and you know, you don't want anyone to suffer. You don't want anyone to have gone through yeah. um, mm. something bad. And But it, it does seem a little bit far-fetched in some of the things. He keeps it? screaming it's nonsense. Isn't he claiming, yes. though, that yeah. she basically just used to sit and watch Netflix, essentially? Well, that's what he says. That's what he yeah. says. But it feels like sort of Depp and Heard all over again, where there's two people suing and counter-suing. You're the more dreadful yeah. person. No, you're the more dreadful person. While everyone sits back and says, you're both dreadful. That's Exactly and the people it. who win yeah. out of this are the lawyers. Yeah, oh, I got my, all that money, can you imagine? Mm. I'd be great at sitting and being paid to watch Netflix, because I think I'd do a great job at that. But I'm scratching on back for that. Absolutely. But there's all of that money it's that's being... working from home. I... <laughs> <laughs> for that money, yeah, that's great. But there's a, there's so much within that that we're getting to, to know about a, a Hollywood star that you just don't want to. You want him to be up there as this, well, you know, Hollywood star, and it's he, he's untouchable and things. And being in there, it's sort of bringing him down, and it's just not a nice look. I've interviewed for him. Robert De Niro yeah. twice, and somebody really says to me, "What's he like to interview?" I said. Well, basically, monosyllabic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He is not the most effusive of characters around journalists. Uh, you, you can un you can see that some of the things that she says and accuses him of. You can see him losing his temper and being grumpy. Yeah. You know, she, I think. Well, and this is the point, though, isn't being it? Described this is what as a grumpy yesterday. old man. He's eighty years old, and he's just been losing his temper. And but it, when he lost the, his temper in court yesterday, yeah. he screamed because shame on you. What's her name again? Graham. Oh, Graham. Graham. Shame oh, on you, Graham. Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Derek. Jack, Dave, whatever your name is. Uh, shame on you, uh, Gra uh, Graham Chase Robinson. I mean, sort of did sort of... I mean, as I say, let's not prejudge the case, but she might argue, well, this kind of proves my point. I would say that. It was one of those moments where I bet his... Can you imagine his lawyers? They've been... <laughs> oh, yeah. Great, great one. We're trying to help you out here and look what you've done. Well, no, yeah. They might think this is two two weeks more on the clock running. Yeah. They'll be like, <laughs> go on, do it more, yeah. do it more. Let's drag this out even further. And her airlines thing, I mean, things like that should be quite easy to find out whether that's true or not. And I think it's about two weeks that the trial's going to run and we'll find out. Two, but two weeks. Been, but we've been two going... Weeks. Been this is going to be fun. It's been going on for four years. They've been kind yeah. of battling to get to this stage, and now they finally are. He obviously thinks it's complete nonsense. He doesn't want it to be to be going on. He doesn't want to be there because it's making him look awful. Whether he's guilty or not, I, I, no one wins in this scenario. Yeah, the, at one point, he, he, his then partner said, oh, you know, you've got to get rid of this girl. And he apparently rounded on his partner and said, no one tells me what to do in my office. <laughs> uh, so uh, he's certainly king of his own kingdom, I think. I knew uh, you'd give us a good accent during this. I knew mm. that you would 
give the actor said you would deliver. Yeah, I can yeah. do my Robert De Niro impression, but that's for another time. <laughs> do I do it? Do I do yeah. a Robert De Niro yeah. or just uh, impression? Or just accents in general. So. I like. Your well, I'll, I'll work on it overnight. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, thanks for Matt, Matt and Devlin from the thank Sun. There, sadly, we've come to the end of the show. Yeah, thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time, same place tomorrow. Up next is Peter Cardwell. Have a wonderful afternoon, and it's been an absolute pleasure having your company.